The Bible teaches that God cannot lie. His promises, then, are an anchor of hope for our souls. Chapter 11 of the book of Luke is simply entitled, Promises That Anchor the Soul. We have three points. Verses 1 through 13, the unshakable promises of prayer. Verses 14 through 36, the undeniable promises of powerful preaching. And verses 37 through 53, the unchangeable promises of persecution. Let's get to our text. In Luke 11, we read this in verse 1. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, how would be your name? Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Well, right here, we, of course, are in the journey section of the book of Luke. And the last time that we gathered, we talked about the fact that Jesus is the way. And that's the motif that Luke is writing right here. He is talking about Jesus' journey all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. That is the way of a disciple. And we find that to be in the way is to follow the way of Jesus. And of course, that's why the early Christians took on the name the way. Now, right here in verse 1, it's very interesting. In the way, we find that Jesus is praying. Then we find that one of his disciples comes to him and says, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Now, we understand that Luke makes a clear distinction when Jesus is with the twelve and when Jesus is with his entourage that include the twelve and, of course, the key women in his ministry right here. And, of course, because the twelve is not noted, we now know that this group is men and women. Are you with me right here? Then, of course, we come to what a lot of us call the Lord's Prayer. Well, there's already so much to be gotten right in the first couple of verses. Number one, Luke is telling us, hey, Jesus is praying. John the Baptist is praying. The disciples want to pray. I guess if we're going to be in the way, we better start praying. Amen, guys? Secondly, we find something that's radical right here. Maybe not for the 21st century disciple, but truly for the first century one is that men and women were praying together. And then he opens on up right here, and the first way that he teaches them to pray is to say, Father, this is a radical, revolutionary statement about the new kingdom that Jesus was building. He says, in the new kingdom, we will address God no longer as simply Lord and Master, but we get to call him Father. In Greek, pater. In Aramaic, Abba. Abba, Father. That's very interesting. For most of us, we look at this text and we say, hey, that's pretty familiar. But one of the things that really escaped me and perhaps escaped you as well is that you'll notice all the pronouns in what we call the Lord's Prayer. Look at them. In every case, it's give us each day, our daily bread. Forgive us, for we also forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation. The Lord's Prayer is not really the Lord's Prayer. It's disciples' prayer. It's a communal prayer. It is a prayer that Christians were to pray all together. And, of course, that shows the kind of people that we need to be. We all have the same Father, amen? amen? And so in going to him, we all come together as his children. And right here, he says, the way that you talk to God is you say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. He talks about, hey, we've got to have respect. But perhaps a stronger word right here is that when we pray, we need to have a lot of awe. You know, in our kind of comfortable society, 
in the 21st century. Awe is one thing we've lost. And in the church, we need to put the awe back in the worship of God. Are you with me right here, guys? And then we see right here three petitions. The first one, give us each day our daily bread. Well, of course, that reminds us of Exodus chapter 16 with the fact that God gave manna to the Israelites so that they could be sustained. And, of course, the whole idea right here is give us each day our daily bread. Hey, a lot of us eat more than just one time a day, don't we? For some of us, it's kind of a continual process, if you know what I mean. And, of course, God is saying, hold it, I want to provide for you every day. I'm going to take care of you, not just every day, but all the way through the day. The second petition was to forgive us of our sins. Not based on the fact that we deserve it, but based upon the fact that we forgive others. And the third petition is simply, lead us not into temptation. In other words, spiritual protection. We need that spiritual protection from Satan and all the temptations in this world. You know, right here, in a very short and succinct way, Jesus is not only teaching us how to pray, but he's teaching us what kind of people we need to be. Implied is to be family, amen? Beyond that is the fact that we are to show the ultimate sign of love, which is forgiveness. Because the unforgiving are unforgiven. And God's people need to have a hallmark. Of forgiveness. We are forgiven people through the blood of Jesus, and we need to be a forgiving people with each other. Are you with me right here, church? You know, one of the things that was really awesome, just a little bit over two weeks ago, we were getting ready for our inaugural service. And on Tuesday morning, we have a gathering of disciples over at the Zindler's house. We call it a staff meeting, but it's really just come one, come all. And um, I really felt the need that, that we wanted to make the first anniversary service, really awesome. And so we took out the membership list, and I had each one of the regional leaders pray specifically, by name, knowing your needs, and together that whole group prayed through every single member by name of the City of Angels Church. Is that awesome right there? Beyond that, we prayed for several of the people studying was it any wonder we had an incredible inaugural service and six more people were baptized into Jesus Christ? You see, prayer makes a difference. Let's move on right here as Jesus continues to show us the promises of prayer. Then Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, Lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me! The door's already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he'll not get up and give him the bread because he is a friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now right here, Jesus is teaching us a lot more about prayer. Yes, we need to come before God, the creator of the universe, with a sense of awe and respect. But that might make us feel like, well, I don't want to go to God and bother him with my kind of mundane challenges and problems. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. That's not the way you should view it. And he tells this little parable that has a little tension in it. I think you can even kind of feel it a little bit. This one guy has a visitor come, and of course, particularly in the Middle East, it's, When someone comes to your house, you've got to entertain. And, of course, back in those days, they didn't have refrigerators, so entertaining meant that you didn't have all the food prepared. You would have to prepare the food. And this particular case, he didn't have any bread. And so he's kind of caught between, well, I've I've got to entertain this visitor, and I don't have anything, but I know that my next-door neighbor does. And, of course, we understand Jesus' analogy right here is that the next-door neighbor is God right here, isn't it? Isn't it interesting that even here in his little story, Jesus makes sure that we understand that God is with his children. It's a family. God and the family is the vision that Jesus wants to give the church. And, of course, it comes on back and says, hey, I can't give you anything. 
And then Jesus says, listen, I tell you, this friend won't get up and get bread for another friend because he asks him as a friend, but because of the man's boldness, he'll get up and give him as much as he needs. And that's what our God does for us. In other words, we need to be bold in our prayer requests to God. Now, we need to understand that it's okay to bother God. On the other hand, if we're going to bother God, we're also going to be bothering his children. And so, biblically speaking, as a church, we cannot be bothered by one another. There's nothing that should bother us because our, our Father in heaven is not bothered by requests. Therefore, those of us that are in his house as his children cannot be bothered by requests if indeed we are going to see God work through our life. And so Jesus goes on, he says in verse 9, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and he who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? This is, this is hilarious. No, no earthly father would ever give a harmful gift to his son or daughter. Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is powerful. The book of Matthew records Jesus saying, yes, as evil fathers, we give our children good gifts, and therefore our heavenly father gives good gifts. Right here, Luke records when Jesus says, hey, your heavenly father will give you the Holy Spirit to those, once more the plural, who ask. Now let's see if we can figure this out a little bit. We understand that the Spirit had not yet been given. That comes on the day of Pentecost. And we understand that as people who respond to God, we have to have faith, we have to repent, and then we're baptized, we're immersed in water to receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what's he saying right here? Well, very simply this. He's saying that when you ask God for something, he will give you the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is how God moves amongst us to do his will. What does the Holy Spirit do? Miracles. And so when we beg God, God will do miracles. Is that fire you want up? Yeah. You know, uh, I, I was really touched just uh, a few days ago when I, I heard about a seemingly sad situation that had occurred in Maria Freckman's family. Um, her grandma had a series of strokes and they didn't think that she was going to live. And so Maria just really started praying. And you know, you know how we feel about our parents when they're aging? Or grandparents? I mean, my dad today, today is my dad's 80th birthday. And, um, you know, you, you, you're concerned because you want everybody in your family saved. And so when Maria heard that her grandma in Florida had these series of small strokes, she, 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 she wouldn't be bothered. And she flew all the way to Florida praying for her grandma. She got in there. She started studying. And last Monday, she baptized her grandma into Christ. 75 years old, and our new sister is Gloria Wilson. Does that fire you on up? You see, if we dare to be bothered, if we dare to bother God, God will send us Holy Spirit and will do miracles in response to our prayer requests. The unshakable promises of prayer. Let's move on. Point two. The undeniable promises of powerful preaching. This is, this is awesome. Verse 14. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left... The man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he's driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Right here, people were blown away 
when Jesus exercised the demon out of this guy. But Jesus, whenever he preached, always divided the crowd. You might say that Jesus was divisive. Not in any sinful sense. But the word of God always divides. As a matter of fact, we have a few divisions right here. We have one group of people who go, ah, he did that by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Another group goes, well, I don't know. I'm just unconvinced. I need more signs if I'm going to believe in Jesus. I kind of find this a little bit fascinating, even the name Beelzebub itself. It actually is kind of a name that's gotten from one of the Philistine gods. In 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 2, I'm sure you know it well, is the god of the Philistines was called Baal Zebub. Now, Baal, we always think of negative, but word, the word Baal just really means Lord or Master. And Baal Zebub, Zebub means flies. So Baal Zebub, the god of the Philistines, was the Lord of the Flies. Why? Because flies and insects would just decimate a community. And so they made up this gut. Now, it gets corrupted over time, and we come to know Satan as Beelzebub, which means the Lord of the Flies, but it takes on a totally different meaning. What do flies gather around? The dead. The rotting. The corrupted. He is the Lord of the flies. Verse 17. Jesus knew their thoughts. Well, that would have been a good sign right there, don't you think? <laughs> Jesus knew their thoughts and said, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Well, Jesus is saying, Hey, Satan's kingdom is standing. I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your fathers drive them out? So then, they are your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Now, right here, Jesus just lays it on out. He talks about, he says, listen, no kingdom can stand if it's divided. And all you need to do is look around society and you know that Satan's kingdom is standing. This world is Satan's kingdom. And so Jesus was trying to, quote, reason with them and say, hold it. No, no, no. This demon was driven out by the finger of God. Now that's referenced two times in the book of Exodus. One time is in chapter 31. It talks about how the Ten Commandments were written. By the finger of God. But most likely the reference that's used right here by Jesus goes back to Exodus chapter 8 during the plagues, the plague of the gnats. Remember there were 10 plagues. The first plague was the plague of blood. And when Moses calls the plague of blood, the magicians were able to match it. The second plague was the plague of frogs. When Moses called all the frogs to climb out over the land, the Pharaoh's magicians were able to match it. But on the third plague, the plague of gnats, when God working through Moses caused the dust to become gnats, the magicians of Pharaoh's were unable to do it, and they themselves said, this has been done by the finger of God. And what Jesus is saying, he says, this man has been radically changed from mute to talking because God has touched him. Right. It is testimony enough to believe. Verse 21. He says, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpower him, he takes the armor in which the man is trusted and divides up the spoils. Now, a lot of people misunderstand this little parable right here. The strong man fully armed is Satan. 
He's ready for battle. He's trying to keep his possessions. What are his possessions? The souls of lost men. What's Jesus say about himself? But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. He gets souls. Are you with me right here? Then verse 23 says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. See, right here, Jesus explains the work of God. The work of God is in overpowering Satan is to gather souls. The work of Satan is to scatter them. Now, very interestingly, just a few chapters back, we find another very interesting passage. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9, verse 49. Master, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus replied, for whoever is not against you is for you. Some people would go, oh, there's a contradiction. I knew the Bible wasn't right. There's a contradiction. Not so quick. There's no contradiction whatsoever. In chapter 9, Jesus is saying, hey, just because these guys are not with us, Hey, don't bother them. They're doing the work of God. What was the work of God? Casting out demons. Helping people. On the other hand, right here in chapter 11, he's talking to the people who are saying, Hey, you're able to do this by the work of Beelzebub, the Lord of the flies. And Jesus is quite strong. He says, Listen, I have come to take him out. I will be victorious. He says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus fully believed a concept that one of my favorite quotes is from John F. Kennedy from Dante's Inferno. He says, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who during the time of moral crisis preserve their neutrality. You cannot be neutral about Jesus and you cannot be neutral about his work. The work of Jesus and the work of those who are in the way with Jesus is to gather souls. Are you with me right here? You know, I mean, it's, it's been awesome. I mean, here it is, a little bit over a year, and the Lord has been gathering. A little over a year ago, 42 disciples came down from Portland. Since that time, 103 people have been baptized. 60 people have been restored. Seventy people have placed membership. You see, there's a gathering that's taking place. And so you know it is the work of God. One person, when we first came, said, your new movement is the movement of Satan. You see, when you follow Jesus, you're going to get the same complaints and persecution. Are you with me right here? But just as Jesus says, hold it, this can't be the work of Satan because Look at these individuals' lives. They're changed. They're radically changed by the finger of God. Are you with me right here? You see, you've got to ask yourself, am I part of gathering people? If not, you will start to spiritually scatter. You know, when a disciple starts to become scatterbrained, they lose their focus. They drift away, and Satan is waiting to get them. You see, if we're not about the work, if we're not in studies, if we're not helping people to be restored, if we're not helping people to be baptized, then we are, in fact, neutral towards Jesus and his work. And I put before you that if you get into a study, it just changes your heart. You know, yes, evangelism is for the purpose of saving lost souls, but you know some evangelism is also for the purpose of saving our souls. Because once you study the Bible about Jesus, the cross, and what he's done, it just reminds you, and you get so grateful. Are you with me right here? You just got to ask yourself, are you in the way? Are you with Jesus gathering people? Or have you yourself begun to succumb to Satan and be scattered, drifting away? From the way of God. Let's keep moving. 
Verse 24. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and doesn't find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrived, it finds a house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. Right here, Jesus tells a well-known parable. He says, hey, you know, this guy has his house swept clean of the demon. But the demon can't find any place to rest. And because nothing good was put into the house... He brings back seven of his buddies, and he's worse off than he was at first. You know, this is a great parable for those people that have been newly baptized and newly restored. Right. Hey, the demon's been chased out of you. But if you don't fill it up with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, if you don't put good in there, he's going to come back with seven of his buddies, and you're going to be worse off than you were at first. You know, I think it's also true about marriage. Elena and I, the last few weeks, have had to jump in on a few marriage situations. And one of the things I've seen is that sometimes we kind of get some demons in our marriage. Like the husband thinks that the demon's in the wife, and the wife thinks the demon's in the husband. You know what I'm talking about? And whatever, you got to chase that demon out, right? But in each case, you got to put something good in. We've also been involved in trying to reconcile disciples. And you say, well, why, why do disciples need to be reconciled? Because you know something? You know what? We really are just sinners. And you know what sinners do best? Sin, exactly. And, and so we've been trying to draw people together. We had such a, a great experience yesterday. Elaine and I drove on out to Palm Springs. It was only 107 out there yesterday. And uh, so... We got out there, and two couples that Elaine and I just love with all of our hearts, uh, Lou, Jack, and Kathy, and Lloyd and Samir, had, had kind of gotten a couple demons into their relationship. And so we had an awesome talk. They were so humble. There was total reconciliation. And, and, and you, could just, you could feel the house was swept clean. But I said, you know something? You need to put good things in here. I said, you need to create happy memories. I said, I got two challenges. Number one, go on a date with each other. Have a fun time. Build some great memories. And number two, let's have the whole East region come on out for the next house church and meet in Palm Springs. And let's build some memories about gathering and doing the work of Jesus. And you know, it was really awesome. All four faces just had big smiles on their faces. You see, that's what happens when you take the demon out and you put the good in. Are you with me right there? Let's keep moving on. Verse 27. Now, we're going through a transitionary part right here. Remember, there were two groups that divided it off. One group claimed that Jesus did it by the power of Beelzebub. The other group says, well, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Give me a sign. So here's the transition. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Now, in the book of Luke, we already found that Mary was calling herself blessed of the Lord, most blessed of women. And since it's in the Bible, I guess it was okay for her to do that. So it's okay to say she's blessed of the Lord. But Jesus right here takes a different slant on it. He says the most important thing is not physical family, but spiritual family. That's a hard teaching. And yet it's what makes God's church so special. Is that you're willing to say, my first priority is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Is to seek first God and the church. Then your physical family. And there are a lot of people that turn back from that. And Jesus now is dealing with these people about the sign. And look what he says is the sign. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. Well, of course, that works in every generation. <laughs> As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asked for a miraculous sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. 
For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. Now, very interestingly, Matthew's take on this particular teaching was to make the sign of Jonah be all about the fact that he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and, of course, paralleling it to Jesus being dead for three days and then resurrecting on the third day. That's not the part that Luke is hitting right here. He is saying that the sign of Noah is the result of his preaching so and you see that in the last part i think it's also very fascinating right here is that he cites two groups to prove the sign number one jonah went to preach to nineveh of assyria those are gentiles the queen of the south is the queen of sheba a gentile and she came the bible says from the ends of the earth remember god gathers from the ends of the earth, she came to hear the wisdom that God had given Solomon. He says, this is the sign. He says, except now, there's one even greater than Solomon. And Solomon represented the greatest, glorious, most awesome time in the history of Israel. He says, and now there's one preaching that has a greater wisdom than Solomon. And yet the people refused to repent. As a matter of fact, the Ninevites, the Queen of Sheba, Gentiles, will stand in judgment of this generation that refuses to listen to the word of God. And now, in the last part right here, he shows the ultimate sign that they were supposed to see and believe in Jesus. Look at it. Come on. Verse 33. No one lights a lamp and puts in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are good, or another translation, healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are bad, your body is also full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Therefore, if your whole body is full of light and no part of it dark, it will be completely lighted as when the light of the lamp shines on you. What he's saying right here, he says, the light, of course, is the word of God. And you don't hide that. He says, I've not hid the word of God. I've openly proclaimed it. And when people have taken the light in, that's what we do with our eyes. We take it in. Then that light comes into the inside if you obey it, like he talked about with that woman, right? And then, of course, the final statement he makes, he says, therefore, your whole body is full of light. Not only the inside, but also the outside. You are the light of the world. You are the sign that Jesus is from God. Did I mention to you that Elena got arrested on Thursday? It might have slipped from that first point. <laughs> the promises of prayer one. Well, I, I probably need to share this because we're a loving and forgiving community, are we not? Well, Thursday, we were at the, the, the DMV early morning. And uh, we're trying to get the license plates, you know, Oregon to California. And so we went up there. I could tell that the woman was a little bothered when she looked at that little TV screen. And she was a little bit uncomfortable about what she saw about our car. And then she said, just wait here a second. <laughs> and you, had, you know, you had kind of that, that little easy feeling right down here that this, this waiting is not in. All of a sudden, these two monster guys, I mean, we're talking monster guys. And a, a shorter woman, and they, they all come out with their, their, their badges. Hey, we're the sheriff. We're the sheriff. I, I was arrested too, so, you know, but that's, that's un, unimportant. Un, unimportant. 
And it says, come with us. I looked over to Lena. Her eyes, like this. I mean, it's just, you know, like this. It's just frightened. You know, and I'm thinking, well, I know I don't have any traffic tickets. I've paid the parking tickets. I hope Eric's good to go. Um, and so we go on in to the sheriff. And the big guy goes, sit here. And I mean, just all the life drained out of a we're sitting there. <laughs> and then the woman comes back on in. Oh, sorry, folks. We, we made a little mistake. The last six digits of your VIN number happened to match the last six digits of a VIN number of a tr stolen trailer. But obviously, uh, you didn't steal the trailer. So, you're free to go, and we'll put you at the front of the line. Then my wife was happy again. You see, judgment just takes out all the light. But when you're set free, there's light all over. The sign that Jesus is the Son of God is that light fills you entirely on the inside and shines brightly off of you on the outside. We are the sign that Jesus is the Son of God. We are the testimony that the finger of God has come down from the heavens and radically changed us. Point three. The unchangeable promise of persecution. Beginning in verse 37. When Jesus had finished speaking... A Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first wash before the meal, was surprised. That's not a good surprise back there. <laughs> then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But... Give what is in the inside of this to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees! Because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and the greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you! Because you are like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing it. Well, the experts of the law answered him, Teacher, when you, when you say these things, you insult us also? Jesus replied, And you experts of the law, <laughs> woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you because you built tombs for the prophets. That was your forefathers who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your forefathers did. They killed the prophets, and you built their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for all of it. Woe to you, experts of the law, because you've taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and you've hindered those who were entering. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. Well, as we can see, this was not a one-on-one -on -one dinner party right here. It, in fact, was a leadership dinner party. Who 
was invited. All the Pharisees and the experts of law, some of your translations say the scribes. And right here, the meal's not even served yet. And the Pharisee notices that Jesus didn't wash his hands, and he was surprised. He was taken aback because it meant to him that he didn't do the ritual washing, so Jesus himself would have been unclean. But to Jesus, he was ticked off at the utter hypocrisy of simply cleaning the inside, the outside, instead of the inside. And so that's why he launches in to his first rebuke. He says, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup, your hands. But inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Have you ever been to some of the singles brothers' households <laughs> and, and looked, looked into the sink? You know, after three weeks, there's that little green mold that kind of starts going at it. Can you imagine, say, hey, God, I want to be used by you. And, oh, by the way, the outside's really looking pretty clean. I've got a little green mold, though, on the inside. I hope that wasn't bother you. The utter hypocrisy. The utter pretentiousness to say, I'm good to go. I'm at church on Sunday, and I'm wearing nice clothes. And I sing loud, and I got my Bible, and I'm looking good. I got here almost on time. I'm sitting pretty close to the front. And yet inside, you are full of crud. And Jesus rebukes that. Next, he says, woe to you, Pharisees. Because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of garden herbs. But you neglect justice and the love of God. You know, I've got to say this. You know, last week, we had our contribution. And in the church here, the leadership has called the membership to give at least a tithe to the work of God. And our pledges come on out as a congregation to 10-5. Last week, we only gave 8,500. What's that mean? We don't even have the righteousness of the Pharisees. I hear people going, oh, I, I'm struggling to, to, to pay this bill off. I'm struggling to pay. Never is there, you know, I'm really struggling to get my tithes. Because it's not first. You give the leftovers to God, let alone neglecting justice and love of God. He says, woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats and synagogues and the greetings in the marketplace. This is adulation. You know something? It's, it's a very funny thing. I fell into that sin in a gross way. Loving the accolades of men. And it's one thing that fakes you out because they say, oh, you're awesome. You're awesome. And then you start believing it. And your life can be full of crud, but you're awesome. And then, here's the, here's the most awesome one, verse 44. Woe to you because you're like unmarked graves, which men walk over without knowing. He's talking to Pharisees. What's in the grave? A dead body. He's saying, you guys are spiritually dead. Men walk over you, they touch you, they become unclean. You are the reason for this wicked generation. No, we need to understand. God holds the leadership accountable for the spiritual well-being of the people. If the leadership is dead, people just walk right over it, and they themselves become unclean, leading to destruction Sadly, even some Christians, you're like an unmarked grave at your work. People don't even know you're a disciple. You're waiting for the right time. People in your neighborhood don't know that you're a sold-out disciple. You're an unmarked grave. 
Jesus would call you dead. And the sad thing is people touch you. There's, there's no direction. There's no hope. You just simply allow them to remain unclean and go into the path wow. of destruction. I find verse 45 ironically sad. One of the experts of the law, a scribe, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. You hurt our feelings. Powerful preaching is going to hurt people's feelings. The humble says thank you. The wicked get mad. Jesus lays them on out. He says, man, you, you scribes, you experts of the law, he says, you keep loading people down with all these burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourself will not even lift one little finger in contrast to the finger of God that changes people's lives. You won't lift one little finger. You will not be bothered to help people. You will not change your schedule. You will not do what needs to be done in order to meet the needs of those around you. He says, woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your forefathers who killed them. Basically, the only prophets you honor are the dead ones. He goes on, he says, he says, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, yes, you'll be held responsible for all. Well, we know Abel's right at the beginning of the Bible. His, his blood, so to speak, speaks to us, prophesies to us to this day. Zechariah is quite interesting. Of course, it's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 20 through 25. In the Hebrew canon of the Bible, in other words, in the original Hebrew Bible, 2 Chronicles was the last book. And so the last prophet killed is Zechariah. He's killed right there, of course in the temple area. And of course, lastly, he says, woe to you experts of the law. You guys that think you know so much because you've taken away the key of knowledge, salvation. You yourself will not enter, but get this, guys. And you've hindered those who are not entering. Now, it's very interesting how Jesus is phrasing right here. He says, because you're not living it and you're not calling people to the word of God, he says, you're not going to enter. And you're hindering those people that are entering. So, God never says it's an absolute excuse on someone else for you not to enter the kingdom of God. At the end of the day, your spiritual leader is absolutely no excuse for you not doing well spiritually. When you get to heaven, you cannot blame your husband, you cannot blame your wife, you cannot blame those around you, you cannot blame your church, you cannot blame your leader. It's going to be you and Jesus. And you've got to be right with God. Well, at the very end of the scene in verse 53, says, when Jesus left there. Now, I had a hunch they didn't really get into much dinner right there. When Jesus left there, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely. And besiege him with questions. So Jesus leaves the house and you see all these Pharisees and scribes just around him firing questions. They are so ticked off. What do we learn? Well, remember, Jesus is the way. As he goes, so those who follow him follow in his steps. A lot of people in the niceness of our society are such conflict avoiders. They don't want to call out sinful leadership that's sending people to hell. Let me tell you something. Protocol was out the window. Jesus was all about honoring his father. And he took a stand for the truth. And he called it out. We as disciples can do no less. To be silent is to become an unmarked grave. Secondly, Luke wants it clear. He wants to explain to us why Jesus was so persecuted. He wants to explain to us why Jesus was so hated. It's because of his preaching. It's because of the truth that he laid out. He was changing people's lives. 
of those that wanted to come to God. But the ones that most fiercely opposed him were the so-called religious leaders of his day. You know, there's a chasm between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day and the religious leaders of our day. And yet we've got to ask ourselves, are we doing the work of God? Knowing that in the way of Jesus, persecution is promised. You know, I was really excited this week when uh, C.L. Salamanca and Josh Aguaya agreed to be on the Hawaii mission team. Is that awesome? And, uh, you know, I mean, C.L. had just moved down a year ago from Portland, and she was getting comfortable here in L.A., and yet we needed a strong leader-type sister to go. And I remember talking to her last Sunday night. I said, sis, we need someone to go to Honolulu. She goes, I'm going to have to pray about this one. She prayed for three days, and she gave me the most joyful phone call back. I'm ready. I believe that God is sending me. It's so awesome having Rick here from the Honolulu group over there, the remnant group. We've got, we've got 15 disciples over there in Honolulu waiting for the mission team. Five of them have been in the full-time ministry in the past. We've got a group of eight headed by Kyle and Joan going there in just a couple of weeks. Can you imagine when the two groups come together what God is going to do in Honolulu? There is going to be a gathering of lost souls. Many are going to be baptized. Many are going to be restored. Many are going to come over and place membership because they see the light of God in these people's lives. Are you with me right here? You know, I'm fired up about Lance getting that uh, San Diego worship service started tonight. And uh, I've, got to, I've got to say this. Uh, you know, San Diego, in, in some ways, is a long ways down there. And it's been tough. There, there have been several people that have been interested and they've seen the light, but it's just too much for their faith to come all the way up here to the quiet can. I appreciate so much Lloydie and Samir that I mentioned before. I clocked from their house to the quiet can, and how many miles it is? 115 miles. You imagine you're, you're in Palm Springs sharing your faith. Yeah, I go this. Where you go to church? Oh, Montebello, quiet cannon. Just 115 miles away. And it's a cool 95 right there. You know, I appreciate that kind of faith, but not everybody has that kind of faith. And so Lance is going down there, and he is trying to gather disciples. Amen. Now, we need to think this through. Now, gathering disciples, what's, what, by inference, it means that Lance believes that there's nothing quite like what we got here happening down there. Now, that's an insult. That's insulting. And then what if some of the folks start coming over from some other churches? Uh -oh. Oh, you guys are recruiting. <laughs> but it's really God gathering. But I just got a hunch that Lance might get into a little persecution down there. <laughs> you know, I'm excited. Yesterday I got two calls from two guys in D.C. He says, oh, man, we just we, we read on the website about Andrew and Patrick and the team and... Um, it's really great. Now, when are they coming again? I said, well, Andrew's coming in June, but the team won't be out there until early August and everything. Oh, bro, there are so many people that are just so thirsty and waiting. Can they come any sooner? I said, no, that's the plan right here that we, we, we've got. You see, we're gathering people. We're doing the work of God there in D.C. And then, of course, there's the New York mission team. And, you know, again... The same bold statement. I mean, this, this young kid, DJ Commisford, this, 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 this kid, he has the audacity to take 20 people into a city of 20 million and say, we're going to plant a church, the likes of which doesn't exist at this time. You know something? I think that kid's going to get in trouble. <laughs> Why? He's following the way of Jesus. 
You know, one thing I think that we did a poor job in the past in doing is preparing people for the fact of persecution. You follow in the way of Jesus. It's unchangeable. You are going to be persecuted. And you will be persecuted most severely by the ones that think they're in the light. The Pharisees would have agreed with Jesus, this is a wicked generation. They just didn't know they were the cause of it. And so today, I want us to make sure that our souls are anchored in the unchangeable and unbreakable promises of God as we gather a remnant that will evangelize the world in this generation. Thank you, and God bless.